everybody and welcome to Olivia Connects. For those who don't know me, my name is Olivia Gudanitz. Please subscribe because I post weekly interviews with industry professionals. Today we are here with Deanie Petty. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Olivia. I am so flattered, humbled, blessed that you've agreed to come and chat with me. <laughs> so that's kind of one thing off my bucket list as long as this goes well. Oh, <laughs> nice. So you flew a pink helicopter, you did the news, you did commercials, TV, you're an author, a poet, you had your own talk show for 10 years, you're just an overall success, and you've checked out all the impressive and porn boxes. So I hope my career is even a fraction of what yours was. <laughs> well, in order to get to where I did, you have to look at one thing. If you measure my successes, which you've just illustrated, the pile's about this big. If you measure my failures, you're going to need a step ladder <laughs> to get to the top of that one. I've often been asked, who do I admire? And I, I recall saying to somebody, you know, I really admire those people that get knocked out, punched down, and then get up and keep going. And then I realize sometimes later that's what I am. I've had a lot of failure in my life. I have, yeah. <laughs> but I get up and I keep going. I don't mind adversity and that is a great gift to have. And you need that if you're going to make it because you are going to fail. Everybody's going to fail. And as I say in one of my poems, drop gracefully to the ground and do whatever you have to do and then get, get up, back up yeah. and go at it again and again until life itself sings through your soul. You've been blessed with a voice that has impacted and influenced thousands of viewers. Was it ever lonely at the top? Or were you just like so busy that you weren't able to take a step back and see all the things that were happening? Well, because my career began uh, flying a helicopter. I'm, I'm a commercial pilot. I have 5,000 hours in that little pink helicopter. I was I was busy, I mean really, really running. I didn't have time to be lonely. I was at the heliport, I was up early. Then I, you know, when I, I ended up being, a, when I was in television, I was a single mother with two kids. Basically, like most women who are working mothers, I was running as fast as I could. <laughs> and fortunately, I'm a long distance runner. So was it lonely at the top? I don't remember being lonely. I remember seeing to my studio audience, you know, if I came down one morning and all of you were sitting in my living room, I'd go, oh, I'll get the coffee, because that's what I was used to. No, yeah. no, loneliness was never been a problem for me. I like being alone. I enjoy my own company. Yeah, you cherish it, right? <laughs> I do. I actually, when I finished television, I moved to the country and lived in the middle of the forest for 15 years just to be alone. Yeah, it's nice yeah. and peaceful. And I saw in one of your interviews that somebody said you did 20 to 30,000 interviews over your career. What I want to know is, what happens after an interview? Were you involved in the editing process? Did you have a say in what got cut and what didn't get cut? No, I worked with, it's interesting, all of the Deanie Petty shows from CTV are in the York Media Archives. And you have no idea how many there are. But I looked at them and there's the master tape, then there's the tape they ran on air, and then there's some copies. So there's like th thousands and thousands of tapes. So they would take the interview, and if it went really long, because it was live to tape, they would edit it down. Um, but I had wonderful people I worked with and trusted that were with me when I was at City and at uh, CFTO. So I trusted them completely. Yeah. Yeah. And you owned a few episodes, or all of them. I own, yeah, I, have, I own the intellectual rights to all of them. And if you go to YouTube, Which and I you did. put in <laughs> Deanie Patty, mm -hmm. I put up some of my favorites. Yeah, I watched a couple of them. Yeah, who did you watch? I mean, did you watch Omar Sharif by yes, chance? Yes. Oh my God, he's like the most. I love that one. So I he watched is so it. charming. Yeah, yeah. Harrison Ford, The Duchess of York, ah. all of the good ones. I mean, there's so many, but. <laughs> It's interesting with the Duchess of York, boy, people can be mean. She gets, she's had 50,000 views, and she gets the one like, she's just a witch, and she shouldn't ran, ran. I'm like, wow. Yeah. I really, I like Sarah. Well, it's easy when people are behind the computer to say negative comments. <laughs> See. Um, what I want to get into is now talking a little bit about if you ever felt challenged or uncomfortable during an interview. I mean, you've done so many, and I'm sure one or two stands out, and how did you cope with that? 
Self-confidence is number of times through. I'm an excellent public speaker. I've been doing it for forever. My first speech, I remember it. There was a little podium on a table, and I learned, and I had a dress on. I learned two things: get a podium that's a attached and is on the ground, <laughs> because ten minutes into the speech, the podium is shaking because I'm shaking, oh. and I had a perspiration stain from my elbow to my waist. So I went, okay, wear a jacket. <laughs> My first five speeches were hideous. My first television interview with Patrick McNee, the original Avengers, mm -hmm. I sat down and I, I memorized it all and the red light went on and I asked him my first question and then I did this. Startled deer in headlights. Hey, we've all been there. No, I froze completely. It's live TV. Oh, jeez. Yeah. At the end of that, I, uh, he could have crushed me because it was awful, but he was very kind and I interviewed him years later. So it's... Learning to public speak, learning to interview, being on television is number of times through. Because as you recall, it was, it's terrifying being in front of this thing <laughs> for the first while. After 20,000, you're like, well, actually, after a lot less. It was like flying a helicopter. After, it took me like 1,200 hours to relax. Until then, I was like, okay, I got it. Hang it's, on. Ah. <laughs> and then you were like, all right, I can do this. this I is get good. this. Yeah, yeah. 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 So if you want to be good at something like public speaking, which they say is the biggest, one of the biggest fears, you have to suffer through being terrified. Putting yourself out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, yeah, yeah. What about your children? Their grandparents, your parents were in the business, your mom, first talent agent in Canada, your yeah. dad was in animation, yeah. you were in the spotlight. Did yeah. they ever crave being in movies, commercials, TV? Uh, my son was born on television. Yes. Yeah. You so, were brave in that aspect. He didn't have a say yeah. in that, though. Did he ever choose to be on? <laughs> no, he didn't in that. Yeah. And years later, when I, I he didn't see this documentary until he's 15. And literally, when he's born, you don't see him, you know, exiting. I mean, I would not put that on TV. <laughs> but you see him being handed to me. Both my children are artists. My son lived in Berlin, uh, Germany, for s four or five years doing minimalist techno. Okay. Which I rather like now. My daughter is an artist. She's a painter. She's um, an artist. She also makes incredible sculptures. So, Wonderful. Yeah, so they do many things, but the best thing about my children, if you met them, they're really good people, and you'd really like them. Well, that's a reflection of you. <laughs> it, it is in part. I, I was a single mother. Um, the greatest compliment my son ever paid me is we were shooting pool one night. And he said, I want to thank you for being such a good role model. And I went, oh, my job is done, Nick. That's so good. <laughs> Go yeah. fly off into the world. <laughs> yeah. We're really good friends. My only advice about children, I have a piece of advice. Yes. Tell your children the truth. Tell your kids the truth. There was the three of us. And I would say, okay, look, here's the problem. You tell me what you think. You tell me what I think. Because we, we're in this together and we got to figure it out. Yeah. So we've always been like that. There's Open communication. Yeah, there are no That's secrets lovely. between us. And my kids would, my daughter would tell me everything. I'd go, no, I don't want to hear anymore. La, 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 la. Stop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it's good. Wonderful. Have you ever thought about mentoring someone? I do. I do. That's what I, why I speak. Um, I was thinking of actually doing a video called uh, The Last Speech and putting it out and where I could do it because I'm, I have some speeches coming up. And I'm 73. Uh, you know, you could read... Oh my God, she, it was her last interview. Um, so I thought maybe I might do it that way. There's a couple of things I say. One thing I say to women, we spend so much money on our makeup and our hair and our clothes and our shoes and our this and our that. Jewelry, yeah, everything. <laughs> we forget one thing. When you What's open that? your mouth, you give it all away. Hi. <laughs> or listen to yourself when you talk. We all speak up, pick up bad habits. And I heard myself when I tuned in saying, I'm going, I'm going to the store for some milk. I'm like, oh my God, I just said that. <laughs> it's for, not fur. Listen to your voice. We're so busy trying to come up with the answer. And if you have a very high voice or you're one of them, here's, here's the voice I really despise. Call somebody's office. Oh, I'm sorry, he's not here. <laughs> yeah. But I know he. Like I wanted to go on the phone and scream obscenities. The so, office voice, right? <laughs> yeah, the, the sweetest person in the universe voice. So, Hi, thank you for calling. Yeah. So yeah. listen to your voice. Listen to your speech patterns. Check yourself every once in a while, because when you open your mouth, you give it all away. <laughs>
Very good. What do you think of journalism and how it's evolved from when you were, I guess, in it day in and day out? Well, I was there, I remember we got a television when I was young, it was like black and white. I remember going down the stairs looking at this guy in black and white going, how boring, and I left. <laughs> it was Marshall McLuhan, that great Canadian, who said the message is the medium. Um, this medium of television and communication on a global scale, I hear from people, oh my God, the world is in such a terrible state. The world's always been like this. There have always been idiots running countries, always. And, and dictators like Idi Amin and Ceausescu and vicious, horrible people and narcissists who get into office and become president of the United States who are like basically unfit for office. Nothing's changed. It's just now we know. People used to be able to hide it. So I think it's a good thing. The evolution of the human race is based on human rights. The day that men and women are equal, the day that we are equal is we can resolve the problems and the only way to do that is get all this information out but then you've got to sort through all the BS and the like, the fake news and the lies exactly. and the Russians. I mean, you, you have to use your own intelligence and read. But it's, I think it's a good thing to get it all out on the table. I think what's happening in the U.S. is a good thing. As my son pointed out, this just might be the enema that the U.S. needs. Because those people were always there. Yeah. And what are you doing nowadays to fulfill that creative drive of yours? I'm writing. Um, I'm still writing poetry. I'm working on a book. I'm, I would like to write a book, but I, you know, I was born here and I did that. It's chapters about the other side of life. Yeah. Uh, is one chapter, murderous rage. So it's about, life is all about the people you meet along the way. So I'm working on that. Um, Do you put it in a cupboard? I think I heard in an interview, you take some notes, you put it in a cupboard, and then eventually it turns into a book. That's what happened with the children's book I yeah. wrote. I, I went to entertain the children at Sick Kids Hospital, and I literally at lunch, how am I going to entertain these kids? And literally, I saw the video in my head of three characters, the queen, the bear, and the bumblebee. I scribbled it out, went, and it wasn't perfect when I recited it, but I did. I threw it in a drawer, and three years later, I pulled it out, and I went, you know what, I'm going to finish that. Yeah. No, it wasn't at all. It was like a year of slogging. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Jeez, I wish <laughs> I had a... That happy surprise. <laughs> the magic drawer. You put in the note, and the book appears. You should do a book with a, a cupboard of short stories or... Deanie's ideas. Yeah, Deanie's madness. <laughs> and if there was another job, thinking back, that you could have done instead of what you did, yep. or yep. something you could do now, what would that be and why? I was asked to become a politician when David Peterson ran and My kids were so young I couldn't do it. I was like, no. Um, the Fifth Estate wanted me to work with them, and <laughs> the guy said, we'll guarantee you'll be home every Monday night. I said, that's lovely. I'll leave a picture of myself in my fridge for my children. <laughs> yeah. Do remember me. But what I'd really like to do and what I enjoy, believe it or not, I'm a frustrated interior decorator. People call me to their homes, oh. and I'm amazing at going, okay, and they go, oh, that's amazing. So I was just thinking today, maybe you should take a course and do that. You should, it's never too late. And I have a house coming up, so I may require your services. Uh. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dini. And thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share with your friends. Take care, and we'll see you next week.